the subject that we're talking about this morning, climate change and energy security, is absolutely central to the subject of the entire conference, sustainable globalization, will it survive the GFC? And obviously there are huge questions surrounding all of this. It's all woven together. Can we get through the global financial crisis while also pursuing the goal of trying to reduce our carbon emissions? Can we make what ultimately must, I suppose, be a transition to new sources of energy uh, without in some way bankrupting our economies and our societies? Now, I should obviously introduce them, uh, although many of them, to many of you, they'll hardly need introduction. Professor Ross Garno, particularly this year, has been so central in the climate change debate. Uh, you may well know also that he has this very, very long and distinguished career as an academic, as a diplomat, as a China expert, and as a, a political bureaucratic infighter of uh, enormous <laughs> skill. He's been Professor of Economics in the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies at the ANU since 1989. Uh, as I say, most of us would know him in the last year or so as the author of the, the, the central author of the Gano Climate Change Review, uh, which was commissioned by the Commonwealth State and Territory Governments. He just told me it was uh, more than 800 pages, and uh, from memory I believe that it was very carefully organised so that no no tree had to die in the production of it. Uh, and I think we all know the process that has been gone through in the, in the ensuing months uh, and the, the political debate that is continuing as a result of that. Uh, many of you with Sydney University or law backgrounds will know Professor Gillian Triggs, who's the Dean of Law at Sydney University. Uh, not so many, perhaps, because she has spent a lot of time overseas. She's, uh, she's been a professor in law at the University of Melbourne since 96, but that she was in Britain for some considerable time. Uh, I've lost the, the, uh, the, the precise references. She can uh, tell us more about that, perhaps. But uh, her interests and her expertise go to international law and international trade, and I think there are going to be there's going to be, there are going to be considerable areas of interest there in discussing the global financial crisis, uh, tariff barriers, how you can mesh the two things, uh, dealing with climate change and trying to maintain globalization. Robert Hill will be very familiar to m many people here, uh, both as a politician and subsequently as a diplomat. He was the uh, environment Minister, and then I think, in, to be technically correct, also Environment and Heritage Minister, and then he was Defence Minister in the Howard Government, before being posted to New York to be Australia's Ambassador to the United Nations. We were just talking, uh, mainly because I'm so deeply envious about the, uh, the, the, the wonderful flat that he's been <laughs> occupying for the last three years with views all around to looking out on the East River. And uh, he was just saying that he, missed, he misses New York, but uh, when he's in New York, he misses Australia. So it's very good to have him back. So let me begin <coughs> by asking you, Ross Garno, to give us a, a bit of a, a tour of the horizon, as they say. Thanks, Mark. Well, uh, on the topic of the session, uh, uh, the, there's a question whether globalisation, as we knew it, will survive the global financial crisis. Uh, the Wall Street and London banks that were at the centre of the old globalisation are either no more or changed in ways uh, uh, that uh, uh, mean uh, the international f financial sector will never be the same again. Uh, one legacy of the global financial crisis will be permanently or, or at least long term significantly lower rates of growth in the United States and some other big developed countries. Uh, it now looks as if the big developing countries won't be slowed that much by the global financial crisis. So we're getting a, a, a transition uh, into uh, 
a, a quadrupolar world with a bipolar uh, core to it more quickly than we uh, would have got it otherwise uh, and probably uh, too rapidly for us to uh, work out uh, how to manage it. So that's a complication for all international relations in the period ahead, uh, uh, climate change amongst them. Uh, it will not necessarily uh, be uh, uh, more difficult for uh, climate change and sustainability issues than for others. Uh, uh, climate change is a diabolical policy problem, most of all because there's no solution that doesn't uh, have at its centre a global agreement, and global agreements on anything are hard. Uh, there are some features of this problem that make it particularly hard. It's harder than trade policy, harder than arms control, uh, because there are no uh, benefits from unilateral action as there are with trade policy. In trade policy, uh, we all know that a country is better off if it gets rid of its protection, whatever the rest of the world does, and yet we still have long negotiations and take a long time to get rid of uh, uh, protection through agreement. Uh, in arms control, at least you get the budgetary benefits of uh, going faster and earlier than, uh, th than others, but uh, there's no benefit from a national benefit from uh, going early. All the benefits come from the effect of what you do on the international discussion. Uh, so there's, a, there's an advantage for each country from free riding. Uh, that's the classical uh, prisoner's dilemma of uh, game theory, uh, and it makes it hard. Uh, the saving grace in this diabolical problem is that uh, uh, the communities in uh, most countries of the world uh, are taking the issue very seriously, and when governments uh, uh, slacken up, uh, they run into political problems about it. And uh, uh, this makes it different from, uh, uh, from trade policy and, uh, and, and arms control. And in the end, it might make all the difference. So, so we've got a tension here between the nature of the problem being fundamentally very hard, but uh, the, the, the community interest in a lot of countries uh, uh, creating options that would otherwise uh, not be available. There is a basis for a global agreement that can be uh, acceptable. It, it, it will be complicated. There'll be a number of elements to it. Uh, there has to be an agreement on a, uh, a, a distribution, uh, an allocation of uh, entitlements uh, uh, to emit greenhouse gases that is widely accepted as being fair. Uh, in my judgment, uh, as uh, embodied in my report and recommendations, Nothing is going to be seen as fair unless it involves moving eventually towards equal per capita entitlements uh, uh, for emissions. Um, a, a second element of any agreement has to be trade in emissions entitlements. There are two reasons why this is important. One is that a lot of the low cost opportunities for reduction in emissions uh, in the early stages will be in developing countries, and, but we will have to provide incentives for them to participate. Uh, developing countries like Indonesia uh, having uh, firm caps uh, on uh, emissions, but then being able to sell entitlements uh, uh, if they do better than those caps gives them quite a big incentive to uh, uh, participate. Uh, and uh, that is all that's going to get a lot of developing countries in. So the trade in uh, permits is, is very important to uh, the global agreement. A third element has to be a commitment from the developed countries to uh, uh, take the lead in development of uh, the new technologies that are going to be necessary if we're going to greatly reduce emissions at low cost. Uh, this is relatively uh, 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 straightforward. Uh, in a lot of our countries, including the United States and Australia, there's quite a lot of momentum behind uh, government support for research, development and commercialisation of one or other of the, the new low emissions technologies, but there needs to be an international agreement on all developed countries uh, pulling their weight there. And the fourth element of an international agreement has to be uh, a commitment uh, to provide development assistance for the uh, poorest countries uh, in adaptation to climate change. In the international discussions, this is featuring uh, heavily. Uh, uh, we're too late 
in uh, dealing with climate change to avoid some pretty horrible effects. Uh, rich countries will be able to manage those much better than poor countries. Poor developing countries need support with adaptation. Uh, handling that in an international agreement uh, is going to be very important uh, to a solution. Uh, to to uh, bring all of this together conceptually uh, requires hard thinking as well as political argy-bargy and uh, I don't think we're far enough along the track to, to expect that it can all come together at Copenhagen but Copenhagen can be an important step in the way where some principles are agreed but there's going to be uh, a continuing process of uh, working through uh, a lot of the details. Uh, it has to be uh, a, a discussion with big technical components uh, in which uh, 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 detailed proposals are talked through uh, before heads of government come together to reach a political agreement and we're just not far enough along that track yet. But, but Copenhagen can be uh, a discussion of an agreement on some principles with more work going on uh, before you get the, uh, uh, the final agreement. There are important connections between uh, the climate change discussion and the energy security discussion. If climate change were not an issue, uh, then the continued strong growth in the big developing countries, uh, first of all China, but also India, Indonesia, the three most populous uh, of the developing countries and others, uh, would be leading us into uh, issues in oil markets anyway. Uh, we had $147 a barrel for oil uh, last uh, July before the, the crisis hit it in the middle of the deepest recession since uh, the 30s uh, oil is $70 uh, the World Bank uh, forecast for this year only five years ago were $20 uh, the, the, sol the solutions to an oil problem are similar to the solutions to a climate change problem and that is development of alternative technologies the Obama administration is right on top of that and leading the world in uh, thinking about that, but they're not conflicting issues, they're complementary uh, solutions. Uh, it is sometimes said that dealing with uh, climate change now would be disruptive to uh, economies that are in the process of dealing, of trying to deal with the financial uh, crisis. Uh, I think uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, problems with seeing the issue in that way. Uh, one is that uh, the period of recovery out of recession is actually a very good time for investment in structural change. Uh, when you've got unemployed resources, it's cheaper to uh, invest in, uh, in structural change, in new technologies as you come out of, uh, uh, of recession. Uh, but uh, there's another alternative as well. I recall a bitter dis dispute uh, within the uh, Clinton administration in 97 and 98, uh, you had the beginning of, uh, of strong growth in the use of fancy derivatives uh, in the financial markets. And uh, uh, some elements of the Clinton administration said, uh, we've got to do something about this. And Robert Rubin, Treasury Secretary, uh, and Greenspan, uh, Governor chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve linked arms and said it would be very disruptive uh, to do anything about this. Uh, well, it turned out that not doing anything about it was quite disruptive uh, and I think we'll find the same if we uh, think that uh, uh, being disruptive in the short term is a reason not to deal now with another long-term problem. On that note, uh, Gillian Triggs... Ross Garner has given us a really good, strong overview of uh, what needs to be done and what's politically possible and not possible. Um, let's get down to the nuts and bolts of, as I said before, how these things are going to be able to be meshed together, what you see as the obstacles and the opportunities, particularly when obviously it comes to international law. Well, perhaps I could, I could begin by juxtaposing what one might see as a potential clash of civilizations. These are huge developments in law over the last, particularly the last 20 years. And we've seen, against the backdrop of attempting to deal with this diabolical problem of, of climate change and negotiation in relation to it, the growth of another major structure of law in the World Trade Organization. And there is a very great potential 
for a clash of these two uh, sets of principles of trade, free trade through principles of non-discrimination, national treatment, most favoured nation uh, that you'll be very familiar with, and the need for an entirely different approach to the management of, uh, of, of greenhouse gas emissions and the ways in which we can reduce it. And these are very big challenges for the future to, to um, manage the potential clashes. And perhaps if I could give you a quick example of where or how a clash might occur. Um, and it, it goes to the heart of the, of the diabolical nature of the negotiations for climate change. And that is that the world trade principles that were developed after the Second World War from, from 1947 on through the GATT um, have been very clear in prohibiting quotas and subsidies or discriminatory and non-national treatment. And if a state, for example, were to subsidise clean, clean technology to encourage um, the domestic industries in, in environmentally sound technologies, it, an inevitable consequence will be an attempt to, for example, put, cross or put border adjustments on products coming in that have not been subject to those kinds of um, uh, subsidies or have not been required to meet expensive uh, obligations in relation to uh, clean technology or environmental standards. Now, the moment you place either subsidies in relation to goods or, or border tax adjustments, you raise the spectre of being inconsistent with these traditional rules of trade that have taken so long to create uh, in that very dynamic environment after the Second World War. Um, the, the answer to the potential problem of a clash lies in, in um, partly the exculpatory or the justifying clauses of the WTO, and in particular an Article 20, which allows states to um, adopt otherwise inconsistent trade measures that will be in the interests of good health or in the interests of environmental measures, including climate change. So what I'm suggesting is that there are very real difficulties in, in, um, on the ground in dealing with, with these, these new attempts to, to um, encourage uh, the reduction of greenhouse gases. But we also have to deal with, with uh, very important principles of international trade that have been placed for a long time. The WTO has established a Trade and Environment Committee, and that committee is working very hard to uh, try to find a harmonization of these principles. And my own um, optimistic view is that we will find ways in which that can occur. So that, for example, there might be favorable trade uh, opportunities of access to domestic markets for goods which have been um, developed to meet uh, environmental standards and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And if these can be agreed, then we can find ways of harmonizing the rules. Uh, so I think that, that it's entirely possible, but you need the political will to ensure that you don't retreat. And this is the great danger if, if Copenhagen is seen to fail. The great danger is a move to greater levels of protectionism. And, and that um, poses a risk to the enormous advances that have been achieved through the, through the World Trade Organization. Um, that's the first point I wanted to make. And I have one other, if I, if I may... Um, and that is uh, to put the Copenhagen um, negotiations into some sort of context. As a public international lawyer for more than 40 years, I've, I've been observing the way in which new bodies of law are created. And it, it perhaps has to recall, be recalled that the Framework Convention um, was in its evolving stages <coughs> in the late 80s, ultimately agreed in 1992, um, was a very, by today's standards, quite a simple document in which it adopted a number of core principles with which we're still grappling, though, at a much more sophisticated level. One being that developed states must take the lead and developed states must um, accept the target emissions and legally binding obligations. Now, what that actually boils down to, and perhaps often isn't mentioned, is that that's really 26 <laughs> states... 26 states out of 193. Um, there are another 11 nations in transition that have obligations under so-called Annex 1. Um, but the practical, um, political and legal fact has been that the obligations have been accepted by a very small number of developed states, 
on the ethical basis that they have an obligation to lead. And the rest of the um, parties to the Framework Convention and ultimately to Kyoto um, have not had uh, enforceable binding obligations that um, are anything more, or the, those obligations that they have accepted have been, a rel- have been of a relatively hortatory nature, certainly unenforceable, and have depended upon a lead role in sharing technology, developing technology, and um, uh, assisting through clean development mechanisms, joint implementation, and so on. But the, the flaw that people so frequently refer to in the Framework Convention has lived with us from that moment, and that is the flaw that a small percentage of states have accepted the obligations, while the uh, greenhouse gas emitting states, particularly India, China, perhaps Indonesia and Brazil and others, do not have legal obligations. And that immediately creates a trade problem for those states that are attempting to meet the standards and to meet targets. You immediately have um, an imbalance in the competitive position. While um, for enthusiasts for the, the early framework convention and for, for Kyoto, that's entirely appropriate. It's um, an ethical and appropriate way of dealing with a situation in which developed states have the capacity and they arguably cause the problem in the first place. Um, but it doesn't work in political, international political terms, and we've seen that it hasn't worked. And what we've needed to find is a more nuanced way of dealing with it. Well, in international law, these things are evolving. Kyoto at a more sophisticated level, and now we have a negotiating text um, produced from Bonn now um, being uh, uh, the, the basis or forming the basis for discussions for Copenhagen in, uh, in December. And that negotiating text, if you have a moment to look at it, or more than a moment, an hour or so, to read uh, 200 pages of negotiating text uh, that attempts to deal with that, that fundamental flaw, if you want to view it that way, from the, from the original framework convention. The attempt, then, is to find a way, and it's, it's quite exciting in many respects, of drawing developing countries in, particularly the lead emission, uh, emitters, in a way that makes being involved in legal obligations more attractive. And uh, Professor Garno has has suggested some ways in which this can be attractive, particularly through through access to trading and then using um, uh, allocations above those which are actually capped for them. Um, And there are various other advantages, um, the transfer of technology, Um, assistance in various other ways. So the challenge for international lawyers and for the negotiators is to find ways to draw the developing countries into the process because without it, I think we will continue to have that uh, resistance from the major developed states, which at the moment have the obligations, excluding, of course, the United States because it hasn't signed up, but uh, most of the others have accepted very significant obligations that affect their competitive trading positions. Thank you very much, Gillian. And and, uh, what you've said provides a a perfect bridge, as you said, to the negotiation side of of the issue. Uh, When you were talking about harmonisation, my mind went back to my own time as uh, Brussels correspondent uh, in the 1980s, uh, during which time, as pretty much ever since, the European Union was... The harmonization was the buzzword in the European Union as the European Union expanded and brought in new countries. Those countries had to harmonize with the European Union. Uh, the, the lesson that I would have t- taken out of that was that it's a, it's a, it's a long and uh, often extremely tedious process, but in that context it could be done. But Robert Hill, you've been for the last three years in what some people see as the Tower of Babel of the United Nations. Can it be done on that scale? Can it be done on a global scale? Well, if I um, just flowing on from what Gillian said, the, in some ways the Kyoto negotiation was, was much more simple than what we now face because Kyoto was simply about um, developed nations attempting to calculate what would be an equivalence of effort in reducing their carbon, their rate of carbon, the rate of increase in carbon output. Uh, It seemed extraordinarily complicated at the time, and it was never intended to be more than a first step. The concept was developed nations who had contributed most of the carbon output in the past uh, would start to reduce their rate of output for the future, they would make a start at Kyoto and then over 
various periods, they would increase their, uh, their, rates, of, um, their rates of reduction. But now we're, we're in a situation where most of the growth of carbon in the future is going to be from the developing world, particularly the large developing countries. Uh, and they are not in this, don't have the same capacity to afford reductions as the developed world, and afford it financially, but and also to afford it politically. Uh, we 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 created our wealth substantially in part from the burning of carbon, uh, and in many cases they don't have an alternative to create their wealth than other than burn carbon. An alternative at the same cost. Uh, so now when we get to Copenhagen, which is really an attempt to try and embrace the large developing countries as well, we have a real challenge. You know, what is their alternative? Can we, we, we can't, in my view, say to them, you've got to retard your rate of economic growth. And from an environmental perspective, that's not a good thing either. And if you create wealth, you then have choices. If you don't you don't have choices, it's, it's tougher on the environment than if you're better, better off. And that's the, that's the huge um, dilemma of Copenhagen, and as was said by somebody yesterday, uh, to take the next step is going to create negotiation, is going to require uh, agreed uh, outcomes between the major players. And the two major players, and it's relevant to this conference, are very much the United States and, and China. Uh, and the, and the uh, global financial crisis has made it more difficult. It made it easier in some ways, in the sense that I agree that, um, and President Obama's picked it up, that this is a time uh, when in some ways it's easier to move on to a less carbon-intensive economy to make the major structural changes. There is an opportunity there. But on the other hand, it's particularly difficult if you see a substantial leakage of economic opportunity and jobs from the United States to the major developing world. And this negotiation between China and the uh, United States in particular uh, is key. And as I understand it, um, Special Envoy Stern's been in China this, uh, this last week talking to them. Uh, and to get from China uh, a compromise that will be acceptable not only to President Obama, but perhaps more particularly to the US Congress and to the US business community is going to be extraordinarily difficult. But without that, you can't get an agreement at Copenhagen.